be here. I always enjoy talking about this. When I first started talking about the Blue River Valley, uh, we never lived in the Blue River Valley. We lived just five miles east of Leonardville, but we went to church in Randolph. And so our church family was just like our immediate family. They were in the Randolph area. Our family did its banking at the Randolph State Bank in Randolph, so we always went to Randolph to do our banking. And of course, and of course at that time, we went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. That was just a given, so we in Randolph quite a bit. And then when my mom had her ladies' aid meetings, we'd go in on a Wednesday afternoon, and us kids would be going up and down around town. So Randolph was very, very much a part of my life. And when we closed the doors of our church in 1960, I was 13 years old. So I kind of uh, lived through this, and it made a big impression on me as to what was going on. And I always said for my parents, who never had to leave, it's a little bit like you amputated their arm and leg some of their best friends got moved hither and yon some hundreds of miles away and they lost that companionship and it's sort of like they were left and all these other people were left and moved on away but the Blue River Valley was a beautiful valley certainly was and uh, the Blue Valley people when they were fighting the dam cited a study that had been done in the 1930s to find the most productive soil richest soil in the world and when they did the survey, they came back and said that the Nile River Valley in Egypt was the most fertile, most richest soil in the world. The Blue River Valley in Kansas was the second most richest, most productive soil in the world. So you can understand why the people were very upset about losing this property. Have your best land in the world, and then just right across the road on the hills, you have the foothills where you have the best grassland in the world. So here you have a farm with the best farmland on this side of the road, your pasture on the other side of the road with the best pasture land, tremendous uh, of value what it was. Now according to a lot of the people, the rumors about building a dam in the Blue River Valley started clear back in the 1920s. I knew a man by the name of Ed Nord, and he said he was in the 1920s, he was working for a farmer up by Cleburne and he was cultivating with horses on a cultivator and he was clear at one end of the cornfield and he saw a couple men come out and do some surveying at the end of the cornfield. By the time he got back to that side of the field, they were gone. So that night when he went home, his dad, who was a jeweler in, Manhattan, in, in Randolph, and he was hired by the state to go out to the river bridge there at Randolph and every day take a reading of the level of the river, see how high it was, and then he would send it on into Topeka. He told his dad about it, and his dad told him, he said, well, don't you know, they're going to build a dam across this valley someday. Well, it wasn't until 1938 that we actually had a bill proposed in Congress that called for the building of a dam on, t on the Blue River Valley to, to build this uh, dam. And so basically the irony of it is none of the representatives from Kansas were in the meeting when the bill was proposed. They were not there when the bill was voted on. So this got the authority to build this uh, dam. Well, shortly thereafter, of course, World War II came along. We don't have time to worry about that. It was kind of put on the back burner. But enough was said about it so that people knew that it was going to happen. So like, say, for instance, here you have a newspaper from 1944, which shows the dam that's going to be built. And this tells that it's going to be down on where it's located now. And it shows this, and this is 1944. So obviously, the thought is out there. You lay the germ of the thought there saying this is going to be done. Now, for a lot of people in the valley, this puts a hiatus on what you're going to do. A lot of people hesitated to build a new home or remodel their home. Why should we do that if they're going to do that? Well, that's 1944. 1949, they come out with a new proposal. This is going to move the dam down to where Rocky Ford is located. And instead of having a 1074 uh, 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 flood control level, this is going to make it 1170. And so that's going to push the water clear up to Hanover, clear up past to Frankfurt, and the flood area would go clear up into Nebraska by moving up and making another 90 some feet in the flood in the in the conservation pool level. So obviously the rumors are out here. Nothing's going to be done though, and it happened that our congressman at that time, every time it came up, would vote against it. 
But then, of course, as you know, we had the 51 flood, and that was quite traumatic. And this is a newspaper showing you just how bad it was. We had two newspapers in the Kansas State Collegiate at that time. The newspapers downtown were flooded, so they went up to the Kansas State Collegiate, and of course, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have the ability to get communication like it is now, so they made a one-page broadside through the three newspapers together to share some needed information to people, what's going on when the flood was going on. So this is a one-page broadside. They just printed all three newspapers together to kind of give an idea of what's happening, what's going on along that line. Now, it's interesting, the guy who was in charge of the Army Corps of Engineers said that when the flood water was in Manhattan, he said, if Tuttle Creek Dam had been built, Manhattan would be dry today. So obviously he's saying, okay, we missed the boat by not building that dam. So automatically now the pressure comes on. So all of a sudden now our congressman, Albert Cole, when the move comes up to do something for this flood relief, because this flood was damaging all the way through. We have some booklets back there. It goes to Kansas City, Topeka, all the way up and down. One of the greatest floods around. So when it came time to do something, Albert Cole looked at the situation and said, you know, it's so bad, I just got to vote for it. And so he changed his mind and he voted that in 1952, the money was appropriated, $5 million, to get started on Tuttle Creek Dam. Now the irony is they call it Tuttle Creek. Now if you know, there's a little creek that comes in from the west into the Blue River down there that's called Tuttle Creek. So a lot of people thought it was just going to be a little dam over that creek. Okay? When they found out that no, it's going to be a dam that's going to go across the whole Blue River Valley, then that kind of put a whole different perspective on it. Why they didn't call it the Blue Valley Dam, I don't know. They call it Tuttle Creek off of that particular part. So the money gets appropriated. It looks like a pretty dead issue. Well, the people in the farm in the area said, we're not going to give up. We're going to fight this thing. And so they go out and they start to campaign and they start to do research and they start to do this and they finally decide the only way we're going to do this is to try to get somebody in Washington to help us. So they go up to Brown County and they find a man by the name of Howard S. Miller who, is a, who says he will be against Tuttlecourt Dam. He'll run against it. So what happens is there's a group of ladies in the Blue River Valley called the Blue Valley Bells and they start organizing. And they organize and they start a letter writing campaign and they start campaigning and they will organize caravans that will drive through the first district of Kansas. And they would get loudspeakers on the lead car and they'd come into the town and say, all right, people, we're from the Blue River Valley, come down to the city park and a little rally, we're gonna tell you about what we're going through and we're gonna tell you that if you aren't careful, your valley is gonna have the same thing happen to it and we gotta stop this now, so come on down and they would campaign for Howard S. Miller. Well, obviously, we're a Republican area. Howard S. Miller is a Democrat. That's a real challenge. But obviously the campaign was stop the water where it falls, uh, big damn foolishness, and they go out and they campaign. And they do a vigorous campaign. Now 1952 was a presidential election year. Eisenhower was lead of the Republican ticket, very popular, very popular in Kansas. And certainly when the election results were, were finalized, Howard S. Miller won in Kansas defeating a Republican uh, candidate when the Republican headliner, Eisenhower, won by a landslide, this caught the nation's attention. So if you go in and look at Life Magazine, Newsweek, Time, all those, and they talk about that election, there's a blurb in there about what happened out here in Kansas to elect a Democrat out here in this area, the first district of Kansas, the first Democrat ever to be elected in the first district of Kansas. Well, he went back to Washington, D.C., and he said, we don't want it. We don't want it. Now, the people, the ladies had beforehand had gone to visit with Truman down at the Kansas City, and Truman said, you know, we've got to do something about flood, and he wasn't too responsive. So they contacted Eisenhower, who's running for president, and they said, we want to talk to him, and he, he was willing to talk to him, but he wasn't willing to meet with him. So they found out he was going to be at Denver, and they just called up and said, we're coming out to Denver, we're going to meet with you, we're going to be there. And so they made it, so Eisenhower would have to either 
agree to see him or else say he's not going to do it, that could be a real campaign ploy. So he agreed to visit with them in Denver, and they loaded up uh, a, a couple busloads of ladies, and they drove out to Denver, and he spent an hour with them. And he agreed that there needed to be something to be done. So he went in, and he, when he proposed his budget, he cut out the money for telecrim. And so what you have here is a picture uh, from the Kansas City Star showing the telecrim project, the dam here, with nothing wondering what's going to happen because this much was done and they were going to put a big fence up around it, the heavy equipment was moved away because there was no money to continue it on. So it looked like maybe they had succeeded. Now at the same time they did this, the Blue Valley people made a film called The Telecrit Story and a lot of times I think uh, several years ago Doris and Le Leona Boleyn who were strong fighters against the dam, uh, when, they, when they finally both of them passed away, uh, I had asked to one of the family members, whatever happened to the Boleyn collection of stuff? And they said they didn't know. Well, they went to Doris's funeral, and uh, it turned out to be Alicia Vandal, and she asked the uh, power of the executor, where is that stuff? He said, well, it's in a, a storage unit here in Lindsborg. And she said, well, I just wonder, there was a history teacher up, at, up by Riley who was asking about where it was. And he said, oh, good. So he had her come over, and she loaded up a minivan completely packed to the gills, and she came to my house and she said, you'll probably never talk to me again, but this is all yours. And so I ended up with a whole garage full of newspaper clippings. I think there was about 50 scrapbooks and newspaper clippings. There were boxes of letters that they had sent to all the congressmen and all the letters that they got back. There was an original copy of the Telecrit story in there. There was banners and all this tough stuff. And after a few, uh, a couple, a few months, I decided I no longer, I shouldn't have all this stuff. So I contacted Kansas State University, and it's, an all, it's all now at the Kansas State University Special Collections Department. And you are welcome to go up there and, and just ask to look at any of this stuff. It's there. I talk to the people who, are, who work there, and they say it's quite an active uh, collection that people are coming in to look at it quite a bit. But anyway, in that collection, we had an uh, original copy of the Telecrick story, and now I think this they ev evidently they have they put it on the cable channel here in Manhattan. You can see it quite often. So I think they have got it from there. But anyway, so they did it. So nobody knew what was going to happen. That that, that film was built there. They were kind of celebrating their success. Well, in 1954, we have another election. Howard Miller is running for re-election. He's a Democrat. We now have three or four Republicans who are running. And of course, you got to realize there are some people who want telecritic. Albert Cole, he says that he's, uh, he wants to run, but there's a, a whole group of people in North Topeka who say, we need less bull and more bulldozers, okay? Because the dam is not dead, and we're gonna get work to get that dam built again because we need it. And they, of course, you see pictures here of North Topeka where the water is clear up to the second story of the buildings, and they're saying we've got to have it. They have a rally at the Topeka Municipal Auditorium. 1,500 people show up, and they march from the auditorium to the Capitol building with petitions urging that Tunnel Creek be started up again. Well, there's three candidates. The guy who wins the Republican primary is Bill Avery. He runs on a, on a campaign that he's opposed to Tunnel Creek Dam. So when the election comes along, now you've got an interesting case. You've got a Republican against the dam, you've got a Democrat against the dam. The Blue Valley people say, we've got it made. We're going to win whatever way. So it's a lot easier to go back and vote your traditional political allegiance. And so in the end result, Bill Avery won the election. Now, once they get back there, when they come up for the budget, somehow or another Bill Avery is not there when the House proposes the bill for what the money is going to be, and the money is slipped in there to restart Telecrit Dam. So there's nobody there to really speak against it, because the other congressmen from our, our state of Kansas are kind of uh, on the fence as to what they should do, so it passes. So all of a sudden, there's quite an urgent cry, we've got to do something. So the Blue Valley people instantly get a whole bunch of people together, and they take buses back to Washington, D.C. to try to talk to the senators now, because they have a chance. If the Senate don't approve that budget, they can stop it. So they go back and try to do it. And obviously, when the push comes to shove, the Senate agrees with the House. 
and the budget is passed. Well, they don't quite give up yet because in 1955, they thought we still might have a chance. So we have an open house of the Blue River Valley. And this is the weekend where they're going to open up the valley. And on the back side here, you have a list of all the historical sites in the valley that are, they can see that are going to be destroyed by putting this dam in here. And you had a place where the churches were open. I know our church was open. They had co coffee and cookies for anybody, all the churches in the valley. They actually had organized tours where you could actually take a, somebody lead you on a guided uh, area around the valley. I think there are three different ways. They actually had a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a whole thing here. So it was quite an exciting thing. Uh, obviously, it becomes sort of an issue of fertility because once the money is there, it starts to go forward, and before long, the money is appropriated, and it becomes uh, just a how, how long do you have. And so they start down at the lower end of the valley, like I think uh, uh, Stockdale is pretty well out by about 1957, somewhere like that. And then, uh, like our church closed in 1960 in Randolph, and so you kind of move along to have that. Now the thing to realize is when they do this, I had a lady the other day who said, now it's true, isn't it, that all the stone buildings in the valley are still standing? They're just covered up with water. And I said, uh, no all the buildings were torn down and leveled. And basically, even now at Randolph, of course, the town site is still out of water. I mean, there's no water around it now. But uh, basically, what would happen is, you know, like, for instance, you own the property, and the Army would come in, the Army Corps of Engineers would come in, and they would appraise your property. If you didn't agree with what they agreed, their price was, you could try to negotiate. If you didn't succeed at that, you could take them to court. And a lot of times you got a little bit more, but maybe just enough to pay your court costs, but you could get a little bit more. And then you would sign your agreement. Now, if you had buildings on there that you wanted, you could turn around and buy them back from the government, and you could tear them down yourself. But if you didn't, you just moved away. The government then owned it, and they would put them up for bids, and somebody else would come in and bid it out. So like in our old church in Randolph, we never chose to buy the building back, the congregation did. So there was a guy from, I think, by Palmer who came in and got the bid. So the bell from our old church is now hanging in a Lutheran church in Fairbury, Nebraska. Uh, I don't know about the stained glass windows where all they went and stuff, but you know, those type of things were not there. But somebody else could come in and buy it, they could move your house, they could do whatever you wanted to with it. And so it was kind of a, you know, a really tough thing to do, because uh, some of these fam places were fourth generation families. Beautiful, big old stone homes that had been put together, and, and it was really quite a, a travail to go through and see that all happen. But that's uh, the, uh, a basic chronological history of what happened in the Blue River Valley. A lot of fight, I always told my students, it's a tremendous lesson in how a group of citizens can get together and stop the hand of government. Because they did. They stopped it for two years. And they had, that, they had that ability to go in and do it. It does show you that the hand of government can be stopped. But obviously, in the end result, they, it, they still got overwhelmed. But at least they did for a little bit. And it was quite, a, quite an effort. Uh, Gladys Phillips, who also lived down by the Stockdale area, was she and her husband were very active in the fight against uh, Telecrick as well. She has now passed away, and so her son and his wife are going through her, her collection of stuff. And they have chosen me to be the recipients of a lot of their stuff as well. So again, I received a whole parcel of stuff from the Gladys Phillips collection. Again, about 45, 50 scrapbooks that were put together, newspaper clippings all the way through, all types of stuff. That stuff has now been given over to the Riley County Historical Museum. And so it's there if you wish to go up and peruse the information from the Phillips collection. Now, some of these, for both the Doris and Leona Boleyn and the Phillips collection, we have saved out some of the slides that they took. So some of the slides you're going to see here is Doris Boleyn in 1955 walked up the hillside of the valley and took pictures of the valley down below her, up from the lower end to the upper end, just so they could be a photographic remembrance of the land that was there. Beautiful, and when you look at that and now realize that a lot of this kind of a marsh, it does give you a cause for, for concern. You know, I, I was starting to say that when I first started going out and giving these talks, 
it was really kind of, it was kind of sad for me to do this, because I remembered it all so well. But now I really look at it as kind of like when you do, and you have somebody who has died and has left quite an impact on the world. When you go out and talk about them, it's kind of like you're honoring their memory and stuff like that. So that's kind of what it is now. We're kind of going back. We could never recreate this area again, even if they dra drained all the water. So we're just kind of celebrating the life that was there, a civilization that existed, a tremendous civilization of people. And like one, one person said when the valley was done, I guess God saw that there was such a good group of people here that he decided we had to scatter out to the rest of the world to share that goodness. And so he took this opportunity just to scatter us to the four winds so we could share that with everybody. And there's probably a little evidence of, of truth to that. Okay, any questions on this before we go back and take a look at some slides that uh, show the valley? Yeah? The other congressmen didn't know what to do. Well, basically, the two <coughs> senators at the time, according to Doris and Leona Valine, when they wrote up the remembrance, uh, Carlson and Sheppel were the two senators, and they were not helping them at all. And, of course, the other congressmen in the state of Kansas were, you know, what do you say to the people of Topeka, Lawrence, Manhattan, Kansas City, who have had this great flood? Are you going to say, okay, we're going to ignore all you thousands of people down here and listen to these 2,000 people up in the Blue River Valley? I mean, why, why should those 2,000 people be willing to share for the greater good of these urban areas? That, uh, so basically, it was pretty hard for them to come out and, and support the farmers up here in the Blue River Valley when you have Kansas City, Lawrence, Topeka, Manhattan, those great urban centers calling for some type of flood relief and stuff. So, that, so it was pretty hard to do that. So you found that it was pretty difficult, actually. And obviously, once the Avery was elected, uh, it became harder for Eisenhower to, um, you know, Republican-wise, to go, you know, for one thing, what happened is, once Miller got defeated, the Democrats were just playing downright mad, okay, in Washington, D.C. So now the Republicans come over and say, well, we want you to help us vote on this. And they're saying, well, look at this, you vote, you defeated our guy and stuff, so it was that inter-party thing again. So it was kind of a nasty situation, so. Uh, and uh, my dad always said they got Avery out of there on purpose. Now, whether they did that or not. I bet you they did. You know, so uh, he was, I think he was on a, a uh, exploratory trip into Mexico, my dad always said. <laughs> and he was out of the country when they came up with this proposal. And so then they uh, obviously go back to the Senate and it was hard to do that. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Well, what are some of the historical plots that are in the area that's covered. Well, basically what they're looking at is they're bringing out the fact that you have like the Marienal Church, a church congregation that was founded in 1863, the building was built in 1866. Tremendous historical thing. All up and down the valley you have beautiful stone homes and valleys there. And they go through here and of course you have the, the children's home. They talk about the suspension bridge, some of the uh, beautiful farms and stuff that they have along there. There are some interesting old barns and stuff like that that are there just to go through it. And just to kind of show you the valley that was there. Beautiful stone buildings and stuff like that. So if you ever have a chance to, if you ever want to get up by the little town of Winkler, going north out of Winkler, there's a little road called School Branch Road. And if you drive up School Branch Road, that is, brings back the greatest memory to me of driving up to the Blue River Valley. Because this is a little country road, stone fences along the side. Every now and then you'll run through a little farmstead with this beautiful stone old house and their stone barns and stuff. And it's just kind of like, it's, it just really brings back a memory to me of driving up and down the Blue River Valley. So, Drive up School Branch Road, it's an interesting little road, uh, quite a fascinating business. It's just a little bit, the Winkler's here, it's just a little east of the, the town side of Winkler, it goes up there. You'll see some beautiful old stone buildings there. Okay, somebody else had a question. How old would the, do you know how old the oldest stone home up there would have been? Oh, you know, the earliest people came into the Blue River Valley in the late 1850s. 
So, I mean, Gardner Randolph came in in 1855, and he basically came in with the idea that he was going to make a plantation out of the junction of the Blue River and the Fancy Creek River, and he brought his sons and daughters there, and they were going to take enough land so they could make this plantation. So he was pretty much a pro-slaver uh, uh, person. Now, uh, then you had other people like uh, that came in and challenged him for his land holdings, and of course he was not prepared to hold on to them, and so he lost it. But they did name the town after him, and at one time they did take and change the name of the town to Waterville, but when Waterville was built up there in Marshall County, they had a railroad and Randolph did not have it, so they took the name back of Randolph, but they never changed the post office name, which I thought was interesting. But anyway, so I would say that some of those buildings were probably built in the late 1850s, early 1860s. Now, Forrest Johnson, who's a relative of some of you who are here, I talked to him quite often, and his ancestry were the first to come into the area, and they were part of the Maria Dahl area founders and stuff. And he says he still owns a bit of land that they actually acquired in 1857 and is still in his family name, so it's never gone out of there. So basically, it's back in that time period. So the stone was a very, the Swedes and the Germans were stonemasons from back in the old country. Stone was readily available here. They found it to be a very uh, uh, ready commodity. A lot of them came out here and they walked to Fort Riley and built the stone buildings out at Fort Riley. They walked back and forth to the land down there. And it always reminds me of the old saying, the first generation came to the land, the second generation acquired the land, the third generation worked the land, the fourth generation enjoyed it. And I think there's a, a lot of truth to that, that, uh, you know, pretty tough. And those people who walked the Fort Riley would go down on Sunday afternoon, work till Saturday noon, walk home, spend Saturday evening, go to church on Sunday morning, have a noon meal, then walk back to Fort Riley. And usually they would pick up a 50-pound sack of flour or something and carry on their shoulder and walk home so their family would have something to be fed. And they would have that. So it's, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of history in the back of it all. Okay, anything else? Questions? Uh, well, we have some slides, and these slides basically are a combination of all types of people. During the 1953, when they premiered the movie, The Telecrick Story, Randolph had a big parade. I think over 5,000 people showed up in the town of Randolph. But there was a guy who had a plane, and they actually landed out on the Otto Johnson farm as a run runway strip. And if you paid him some money, you could, he would fly you the length of the valley, from Manhattan all the way to Blue Rapids. So a man by the name of Harold Daniels in Leonardville flew the flight and took pictures as he went up and down the valley. So we have some of his pictures that he took, aerial pictures of the valley. We also have pictures from Ed Nord, who was quite a photographer at that time. As we said, we have Doris and Leona Bleen's pictures. We have pictures from Gladys Phillips. So through all of those, we get a little bit of a flavor as to what the, the valley was like. And you can start to see a little bit why there's such a feeling even yet among people about what was lost and such at that particular time. So we'll shut the lights off and we can take a look at some of those. Written by one of the early settlers of Randolph and he wrote about it in 1923. Uh, when he had settled in Randolph, he had to make a trip to Clay Center. And he said once he got out of the valley, he saw no sign of civilization until he got to Clay Center. And he said, I personally don't think there ever will be any civilization up there because there, the land is so harsh and doesn't show no signs of any type of settlement. And so this is all grassland. Of course, we know that because of the prairie fires, that's why you didn't have trees. And of course, even President Harrison commissioned the Camel Corps out here for Kansas because there was no trees. They thought it was a desert. And that's why they came up with that. But eventually, the pioneers come out. And of course, this is a very popular picture, uh, the dugout uh, that they lived in. My great-grandmother homesteaded above the Blue River Valley in a, in a dugout. And so they lived in dugouts because kind of hard to do, but eventually they found Sod. This is the house that was located out by the, where the airport is now, Sod House. Then we go through and uh, the old log cabins, and this of course is the log cabin that's in the city park, 
that was built back, I think, about 1915 by the pioneers to illustrate the crafts that they knew, and it still stands. And then, of course, the interior, everything took place in that one room. But eventually, they built stone houses, and uh, stone was readily available. And uh, there you have one of the stone homes. This was actually my great-grandfather's home out by Wallsburg. And that's my grandfather and his sister and his brother standing out there by the house. The house is still semi-standing. It's kind of falling in now. But then if you had money, you could go to town and buy lumber and build a store-bought house, which was a lot nicer, they always thought. Showed prosperity, but probably not as warm as a stone house. And then you just sat back to enjoy the good life. And this is uh, Sunday afternoon in the front parlor. Okay, schools were very common to, you built that first, and then a lot of times churches met in the school. But this is a typical one-room school. This is a teacher standing at the door at the Winkler School waving to the kids as they're getting ready to go home, I guess. But the real key to our whole area was once they got out here and they found the Blue River Valley, this was the key that they were all looking for. And as you can see, this is a picture, aerial picture, and you can see the river meandering back and forth all across the valley here. And you can see that this is the highway that went from Randolph to Manhattan on the west side, and over here would have been a, a sand road on the Pottawatomie County side. And so there you see the sand road over here. But you see the farmland all the way through there. And of course, farms would be built up in little draws going into the valley. And you just had the valley, again, the river meandering back and forth. So this was quite the cause of all the consternation. And these are just some pictures that are taken now. A lot of these early pictures, I gave a little presentation to the Stockdale reunion group. And this is going to be a few pictures more centrally located around Stockdale. But you'll see as you look up from the hills out into the valley that you can see a little bit of what the valley was like. Okay, but before we do that, this is actually uh, uh, showing one of their little towns there. I think that's Irving. This is Randolph from the air. And you can see right here where the town square was. This is the grade school over here. The high school would have been located here. This little thing there is a steeple to the church that I went to. It's kind of a little bit blurry. I think the plane kind of twisted as it got there. Now this is a little better. But you're looking down here, and this is the road going out to East Randolph. So when the railroad came up the valley and missed the town of Randolph, so they started a little area called East Randolph out here. You can kind of see if you saw it close enough, there was a couple of elevators there. The depot would have been about here. There are a few houses along in here. This is the road that would have taken you up to Cleaver. But the town square is here. Here you see the, the church steeple again. And that's the town of Randolph here. Okay, on up the valley, then you have the town of Cleaver. And this is just a picture of Cleaver, the river bridge of Cleaver, the railroad going up here, little town of Cleaver here. Okay. Today, if you go up to the town side of Cleaver, they try to keep a park at it. Uh, you can walk on some of the streets. You can still see some of the sidewalks. Uh, some of the uh, you know, retaining walls and stuff are still there that are it's normally out of water except under extreme flood conditions. So the rivers are our culprit here. This is a little town of Stockdale. Here's a church. Here's a school. Highway going through here. The railroad going up here. And the river coming right along the railroad track. And such. This is the town of Stockdale. The church is here. Some of the housing that was there. This is the highway going through the town. And this is the school building. They had grade school, high school here. Eventually the high school would close down and the students, most of them went into Manhattan to school. Isn't that where you went to school? I went eight years here. You did? And, and then, then you went to Manhattan for high school. Okay, so high school was closed. So you live, what, about a mile or so uh, west of about, Stockdale? Yeah, about two miles west. About two miles west of Stockdale is where her farm place was. This is the Stockdale River Bridge. Now notice in, on the river you had a crossing at Stockdale. 
you had a crossing of Garrison, you had a crossing of Randolph, you had a little bridge at Mariadol, you had a bridge at uh, Cleburne, you had a bridge at Irving, so you had several places to cross. Now, when I was a student in high school, my history teacher, Mr. Schauber, said his dad was the uh, supervising co contractor for Telecrit project. And he always said that they were originally going to have a crossing on the dam, they were going to have a crossing at Stockdale, a crossing at Randolph, and a crossing at Sweet Creek. But when the Blue Valley people put up such a fuss, they decided to forget all that and just made a crossing at, uh, on the dam and at Randolph. Now, you think about how that would have opened up the, the property at the Stockdale area to the west side of the area if there had been a bridge built there at Stockdale. That would have been quite interesting. But this is the bridge, the old bridge of Stockdale. And they were quite interesting. Here you're standing on the bridge. Notice the planks and such mm -hmm. that there. You go across, you drove across, and the planks would kind of clap after you and stuff. You went around there. That's quite interesting. Now, they were saying that they knew kids from Stockdale who ran across the top part of the bridge. Quite interesting. That's the bridge. And this is the river of Stockdale again. And of course, the, we have the dairy farm there for the Phillips family. This is some of their cattle there in the Phillips farm. And this is just going to be some pictures of the farmland that's set around Stockdale. Now today we would say that's a mighty slow way to farm, but that's a little probably six foot combine. Actually. But these are some of the pictures of the farmland here that uh, is now underwater. Now there you can see, taken from the Phillips farm, there that's what the dam was built by 1953. So they had built it over to the river, nothing on the north side. Maybe just a little bit of the control tower you can see there. But in between, this is what they thought was just going to be left when the uh, funding stopped. But this is just some more pictures of the farmland. So you can see that's some beautiful farmland out in that area. These would be taken up in the pasture land looking down on the valley. And this is a sort of a morning where the frost just covered the trees. And this would be the Phillips farm down below us here, looking out across the valley. They were on the east side of the river. Today, this is actually that bypass road they built. So when they were building the dam, they built that road bypassing it. And now the, uh, the Germans and Rosalie Thompson have built houses all around here. So I'm sure there, today there's houses up there. This is off of that road. of getting a feel for the land that was there. This is all around the Stockdale area. So you can see that it makes a perfect area for a reservoir because you got the high hills on both sides about a mile or so across and you can put a dam. You got a nice area but certainly some beautiful farmland. A lot of people think that because we built Tuttle Creek, that saved the Cairo Dam. And the Cairo Dam was going to be built down by Silver Lake and go across the Kansas River Valley, and that would have made a lake that would have extended up to Long Beagle. And so that would have flooded out the Kansas River Valley. So by building Tuttle Creek, that saved that dam from having to be built. So a lot of people feel that was a compromise. Obviously, the 51 flood <coughs> occurred, and this is an aerial picture showing down here where you're down at the end of Points Avenue. This here is a community building, or I maybe mean, no, this is probably the community house. So basically, all this here is torn out to make way for the mall. <coughs> what happened to uh, the farms in the Blue Valley during the 51 flood? 
Basically, were they, they were not very much mm -hmm. flooded. Uh, no. no, they really weren't. In fact, that's what the Blue Valley people show, tried to point out, that the water came in from the Kansas River Valley. In fact, if you look on the 4th Street of Manhattan, if you ever see pictures of it, the parking meters are bent to the north from the force of the water current coming in. And Leroy Peterson, who lived out on Knox Lane out there and by the, the Northview area, he said that he could stand out on his farm and he could just see the water pooling back. So like even Randolph and such were not really flooded that bad during the 51 flood. But, so they tried to point that out, but of course, once you get your mindset that you're going to do this, it's pretty hard to convince them. But basically, the, the Blue River did not cause the flood. They tried to point that out, but it wasn't going to happen. Uh, Kenny Kent's my neighbor, lived out on Hunter's Island, and he said he was out with his dad trying to rescue a few things. The water was coming up, and he said, we looked off to the south, and there was a six-foot wall of water coming across the valley. And stuff that and, and that large area he said we just had to get out of there because this wall of water was coming across the valley that had been built up by all the water coming. So there's another picture of the city of Manhattan. And of course you can see why Manhattan is concerned because this little map they show of all the floods. So this was uh, uh, in 1903 we had the flood that came up through here. 35 flood in 1955, 50, if you go back here, I think this is 38 flood here, and this is 51. And this was the grandmother of all, 1844, where the water would have been up to the K-State campus on that one. And they said that the Indians told the settlers when they came into the Blue River Valley in the 1850s that to be prepared because they had seen water from hill to hill. And they set out a file creek, which is a little creek right below Telecrick Dam, and now they have a little park, park along there, that the files, when they came there, they saw debris from that 44 flood halfway up the hillside above where they were. So the sticks and stones and stuff were up there from the debris of that flood. So Manhattan is saying, hey, we need flood protection. Let's get some help here. And so then the Blue Valley people, of course, said, let's uh, be destroyed by big damn foolishness. This was a sign on the square of town of Randolph. And I used to walk by there and think, 85 feet above my head. That's going to be a lot of water. But now today, you wouldn't have any water there. But it was quite the, the uh, slogan, big damn foolishness. My, we went out to Western Kansas to a church conference. And Dad always talked about how he was standing by the car at over the noon hour and he had his little stamp his bumper sticker said stop damn big damn foolishness and these two little ladies walked by and saw that bumper sticker and they looked at each other and said well we never you know like <laughs> why did anybody talk about big stop big damn foolishness so, anyway this here is the house that uh, this was the home of bill hinton they were the first ones to sell out for the dam in 1952 and this, is a, this house is located where the control tower is now. So that was the first place to be sold out. A lot of people gave Bill Hemp a little uh, guff for selling out, but like he said, what can you do? They're, they want your land, and you gotta do it, and stuff. But he was the first one to sell out, and this is where the control tower is. And so as a result, then you go through and start tearing things down. And obviously what they did is they tore everything out. I suppose somebody was going to come along and get the stone out of this house, so they left the stand for that part. And so this is Stockdale. That's the Stockdale Church, the house across the way. Another picture of the Stockdale Church. Another sort of appropriate picture, sunset of the church. Uh, you had other towns. This is a town of Garrison. There was a school, there was a little church. This is a church that was moved to Manhattan, became the Blue Valley Memorial Methodist Church. Another picture of Garrison. And this is some of the land around Garrison. Now 
I think farmers today would be a little appalled at all the weeds in that uh, farm there, but uh, yeah. you didn't have a lot of herbicides. So I'm driving up the valley. Again, a picture of Garrison. This was moving the church. Mm -hmm. The big problem was how are you going to get this church across the river? Because it was in the, on the Pot County side of the line. The Army Corps finally let him come up and use their construction bridge. This building actually sat out in a field for a year. It took a year to move it into Manhattan. And the people always say they were very pleased that nobody vandalized the building while sitting out in the middle of the field for a whole year. The stained glass windows, everything survived and we moved it into town. And this is where it is now. Interesting, out of all the churches that existed in the Blue River Valley, the only church that really survived was the Randolph Methodist Church. All the other church groups pretty well dis disbanded. Now, the Irving Presbyterian Church was taken into Blue Rapids, and they tore the building down, and they added an addition to the Presbyterian Church in Blue Rapids with the stone from the Irving Church. But other than that, all the other churches disbanded. And this church here was called the Blue Valley Memorial Church in memory of all the churches that existed in the Blue Valley. So there you see, this is this abandoned house. This actually turned out to be the Phillips home. I had no idea. This was a slide that somebody had given me. This is actually the Curtis Phillips home. And this was my old church that I went to in Randolph. They had the walls halfway torn down. My great-grandfather hauled some of the stones to build the walls of that building. And then this was it after it was all set and done. And this yeah, was, uh, we, what was the name of that church Grandpa and Grandma lived there? Well, that was the, what they call the Randolph Mission Covenant. Mission Covenant, yeah, yeah. And so this was the closing day when they came out at the very last and they closed the doors and they gave the benediction saying the work of this church is now complete and they tore it all down. Now I would really have loved to have this stained glass window was above the door, but that was not to be. Okay, now we'll see. If you're still game, this is actually the Otto Johnson farm. And this would be Forrest Johnson's parents who we were talking about earlier. This was right east of Randolph. The Johnsons were very integral in the founding of the Marietta Church. Marietal community. The area was named after their mother, Mary, Maria, who it was Maria's Valley, Marietal, and so this was their home. Now it's interesting that almost every farmstead, as the water started to come in and flood the valley, the last place to get flooded was where they built their house. It was always on the highest point of the farmstead. So that was it. Now here you see another aerial picture of the road going up the valley. Uh, that was taken that day. Now this is uh, the church. And you can see that uh, this building was, uh, the church was started in 1863. They built the main sanctuary in 1866. They added the steeple and stuff. But uh, this was kind of the crown jewel of the Blue River Valley. Kind of sim symbolized the, the valley all the way through. Uh, these are just some different pictures of the church. This is one taken in the winter time with the snow. I'm going to say a few pictures. This is actually taken inside the church. Now the altar painting at the front of the church there is now hanging in the First Lutheran Church in Manhattan. It's over the door as you leave. The altar is in the First Lutheran Church. The communion rail is in the Rodney County Historical Museum. The organ was actually acquired by one of the members of the church. He kept it in his uh, garage here in Manhattan. <coughs> thought maybe when they built the First Lutheran Church in Manhattan, they could use it in the church there, but they did not. So he advertised it, and a church in Texas bought it. And took it down there and, and sort of restored it. And uh, they had quite a opening, you know, uh, what do you call it, a celebration when they dedicated that organ. Well, a few years later, some kids broke into the church and damaged the organ. They restored it, and then a few, a little bit later, some kids broke in again and this literally destroyed the organ. Now, if you want to read about it, go on Google and type in Maria Doll, Kansas. 
and they will bring you to this church in Texas that had the organ. They will show you pictures of that organ in their sanctuary. They will show pictures of it all beat up. They will show you the programs that they had where they dedicated the organ and stuff, but they'll give a little history of it. But if you type in Marino, Kansas, and Google, mm -hmm. you'll get all that history with it. But that's kind of a sad story of the whole thing. Now this is standing out in the cemetery, looking up to the church. The cemetery was north of the church. The last Christmas that they had, they decided that they would try to light up the outside of the church. So they rigged up lighting and uh, took a picture of the church at night. Now this is a picture taken from the belfry of the church looking out to the cemetery. The steeples at the one in, in, in Oldsburg, Oldsburg yeah. yeah. They restored the steeple. And this is a picture of the cemetery. That was to the north there. And then this should be, and then of course they had to move the cemetery. Of course they moved the houses. Now if you drive on Browning Avenue, yes. you'll recognize this house. It sits on Browning Avenue. This was a Holmstrom house in Randolph. And it was moved out of Randolph into Manhattan. This here was a Walt Bell house that was moved to Leonardville and it became the home of Ed Nord. They actually built a little crossing there in the Fancy Creek River just a little bit to the southwest of, of Randolph so they could have a crossing of the river to move these houses out. And of course you tear down the building. So here you're tearing down the grade school building. Uh, this is just a picture of the town of Randolph as it's being demolished. Someone came through in the midst of this demolition and stopped at the gas station that was still operating in Randolph and they thought they sure had a heck of a tornado come through here. So, town Square with some of the buildings being torn down. This was the Citizen State Bank building. Obviously your money was safe there because they they literally tried to bulldoze it over. They couldn't bulldoze it over. They finally had to take dynamite and just blow it to smithereens. It was that solid. This is looking out over the town side of Randolph. This was the Methodist church as it was being the remnants of it. Uh, these are some of the pictures that the Doris Boleyn took as she walked up on the hillside looking over the valley. You're walking through, seeing the valley, seeing some of the pictures there. I think this is kind of a classic picture. This is the August Richter farm out north of Randolph, the little farming up the little inlet, the railroad going down through there, the farmland. Just looking out across the valley, some of the farms. You can see, well, one of the things the Blue Valley ladies did and sponsored was that on a Sunday evening, they would have a hymn sing. And they would find the spot on the hillsides overlooking the valley, and they would say, all right, we're going to meet at this point. So the people would go up there, and they would sit on blankets and look out over the valley as they had this hymn sing. And usually they would bring an old pump organ out on a wagon, and they would have somebody lead the music, and maybe somebody give a little meditation. But they would sit overlooking the valley and have their hymn sing. I can remember I went to several of those that we were up overlooking the valley and sing. And as the evening light came in in the summertime, you'd have the breezes come in, and you'd look out over scenes like this as you sang the hymns. You kind of see the river there towards the middle with all the trees around it. There you see the river off to the side. Now I believe if I remember right, this this here is the barn that was on the Otto Johnson farm. So it kind of sat out here. This is the Blue River here.
So it actually was about a 50 mile span from the time you go from where the dam was built clear up past Irving, Bigelow, and that area, about a 50 mile span of uh, area. The one thing I've always found interesting is that as, a, as I looked at this, I figured that everybody in the valley was kind of one unit of people. But you really find that the people around the Stockdale Garrison area really didn't know the people around Gar uh, Cleaver and Irving and stuff. So they were kind of unified in their fight against the dam, but their communities really didn't overlap that much. Some beautiful sights along the way. Now this here again is a town of Randolph. So here you see the blue, the Fancy Creek River coming in down here. This is the Blue River here. I remember I had Ed Dory come out and talk to my students once, and they said, well, why didn't you build the town a little closer to the river? Why did you build it so far away from the Blue River? He said, well, we weren't that dumb. We wanted to build it away from the river so we wouldn't be flooded out. As you can see the town up there now, a little bit there. There needs to be a few pictures of the area around Randolph. This is uh, going out east of Randolph. This is actually where uh, uh, Alicia Vandal, her farm was. Actually, you got up to about here, there was an intersection. You turned off a road and went down here a couple miles to the Rudolph Church. This is the Randolph Depot. The Randolph School. It's interesting, they built that school in the 1890s and they used it clear up to the time that the telecourse went in. But you gotta realize is that with the threat of the dam hanging over the town, there was just a lot of resistance to try to go out and spend much money. Someone told me, you know, we thought about putting indoor plumbing in our house, but we thought, why do it? If they're gonna come and buy our house and take it away. So we never did, uh, and such. That's what my parents always yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I remember that in about the 1953-54, in that time period when Telecrypt was stopped, a couple people built houses in Randolph, and everybody just thought that was so amazing to have some new construction going on. This is the Randolph High School building. This is their Boag building. You know, in the 1950s, there was a government program to provide rag buildings to these schools, so they did build that in the 1950s. This is a town square. Yeah. They had a bandstand in the town square. They were that in town. What? They were that in right Well, actually, they didn't move it. They built a reproduction of it. So there is another uh, gazebo like this in the new town of Randolph. This is the town square over here. This was my Walmart of the day, that little corner <laughs> drug store. Mm -hmm. You could go in there and you could just find anything you wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. And he would open up at 12 o'clock. He'd go to church and then he'd go down to the drugstore and open up for about a half hour. So we could stop by and buy a little pint of ice cream to go home to have with our Sunday dinner because we didn't have big enough freezers to hold ice cream. But he'd open up so you could buy a little pints and we'd come home and have a little ice cream for Sunday dinner. Mm -hmm. so who ran that one? That was a guy by the name of Peterson. Virgil uh, and, or Virgie and, oh, what was his name? They had a boy by the name of Lyle. Yeah. Peterson was his name. And I forget the name of the dad. But they, That's a Citizen Bank there. Yeah, this is the Citizen State Bank right there. And of course, you know, That's Walt Bell State took State that State. bank and brought it into Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So he was, at the time, he really had to fight because the bankers didn't want another bank in town. And they had to really work hard to bring that bank into town. And they finally relented and let him bring the Citizen State Bank into Manhattan. Where did they set it up? Well, it's right there where United, United Missouri Bank is now. That's where it is. That's the old Citizen State, State Bank. bank. They sold yeah. out to United Missouri Bank. And this, of course, another picture of by then, Citizen State Bank has moved out, and there was a guy by the name of Mel Griff who sold TVs out of that building <laughs> in the latter years, of, the last couple of years of Randolph. <laughs> this is the Randolph State Bank. This bank was so solid in finances that when Roosevelt closed all the banks in the 1930s to stabilize the banking situation, 
this bank never closed. The Johnsons, uh, it, what they said in Randolph was the Swedes bank at the state bank, Citizen, the Randolph State Bank, the Germans bank at the Citizen State Bank. And of course, we were Swedes, so we always banked at the Randolph State Bank. The, Randolph State. the Johnsons were pretty level-headed, evidently good managers of their banking. And so when the, when the uh, dam took them out, several people wanted to buy the charter for the Randolph State Bank, and Elston Johnson, who owned the charter, said, no, we're not going to sell it, we're just going to close it. This is another picture of the town square. This was Doc Atwood's house right next to the Preston, to the Methodist Church. This house was actually moved into the new town of Randolph. Ironically, it sits across the street from the Methodist Church, and the new town of Randolph sat right next to it in this one. Kevin, do you know the story about him having his house next to that church? Uh -huh. My cousins tell me that he used to keep the window open in the church. He sat on the window closest to his house, and he'd keep his house window open. If there was a call that he was needed, he could hear it while he was at church, and he'd leave and go to take well, care about of that? That's a classic. I've never heard of that before. That's a good idea. <laughs> this was, of course, the Holmstrom house that was moved into Manhattan and now sits on Browning Avenue. In the 1966 tornado, it took the roof off in Manhattan and they rebuilt the roof. It's got a little bit of different roof line. They now have a porch all the way across the front of it, but it sits on Browning Avenue now. This is quite a nice home in the old town of Randolph. Randolph had a swimming pool. They, they got together in the 1920s and the farmers came in with their horses and slips and they dug this swimming pool out and they made this pool about 1923, 1924. They, they, they took donations from the community to pay for it. Because of the way it was built, the deep end was in the middle. It was shallow all the way around. That was really nice for me as a kid who couldn't swim. You had a lot of room to run around with because the deep end was in the middle. You had your diving tower in the middle and stuff like that. It was quite bad. We, I remember we'd have a church activity and of course my mom would say, you have to wait an hour before you go swimming. And so we try to eat as fast as we could, so an hour would get over faster, and then we could go down to the swimming pool and swim. And it had a cement bottom? It had a cement bottom, uh -huh. yes it did. Now uh, this was our church in Randolph, the old Mission Covenant Church. Actually. That's another picture of it. Now the other church in town, this was actually the interior of the church. And this was a Methodist church. Now today, if you go to the Fairview Presbyterian Church, it was right across the street from the Raleigh County High School, you will see at the front of the church a stained glass window with the American flag in it. Well, what they did is when Randall, when this church was being torn down, the Fairview Church, which had windows like this size, came down there and they were able to buy enough windows to put in their church. And Fairview had a little opening like this at the front of their church that was just a plain glass. So they took that stained glass. One of the, there were two of them in the steeple. One had a cross, the other one had the American flag. Well, when they took the one with the cross to put in the front of the Fairview Church, it just fell into pieces. So they decided they'd go ahead and take the one with the American flag. So at the front of the Fairview Presbyterian Church is a stained glass window with an American flag in it at the very front of it. Now the Oldsburg Methodist Church is full of the stained glass windows from this church as well. But this was the Methodist Church. Not very handicapped accessible. <laughs> <laughs> And there's another picture of it there. And these are some more pictures of the valley. Now this is Little Cleburne. Now this is a sign that they had in Cleburne, but they made it into a monument and put it in the Bell Guard Cemetery, which was the Cleburne Cemetery. And of course all the cemeteries had to be moved. And in this one book back here, Leona Galeen was uh, had a round robin, and she would write every so often on her round robin what was taking place. So I made copies of her letter about what was going on. 
The last one she writes tells about the closing service of the Riedel Church, and she also tells about when she and her sister came to the Riedel Cemetery to be there when they opened the graves to move their families. The, the government wanted someone from the family to be there when they opened the graves. And if you couldn't be there, they hired a couple of men. A couple of my old retired neighbors were hired by the government just to go out there and be there when they opened the graves because obviously people at that time were buried with jewelry. They just wanted to make sure that if they dug up a grave and the casket fell apart and there was jewelry, that everything was put back in its place and it was all done in, in oil to a proper way. So they moved the cemetery up to the hill uh, out of the valley and they made this monument where they left their native land of Sweden and found new homes amid these eternal hills and lovely valleys. Now it's interesting, Cleburne was caught up just a little bit, This uh, the Velgard Cemetery is just a little bit north of the Sweet Crit Valley. The Swedes had the lower part of the Sweet Crit Valley, the Germans had the middle part, the Bohemians had the upper part. Today, the Sweet Crick Methodist Church still stands. It was a German church. If you go into their church, they have a historical board, and in there is a picture of their church when they dedicated it in 1918, and there's an American flag flying from the steeple. Now, according to the old stories, the Bohemians that were to the north, when they built that, the Germans built that church, they said, they came down and said, we hear you're gonna fly a German flag from the steeple of that church on the day that you dedicate that building. And we want you to know if there's a German flag flying down on there, we're coming down and we're gonna shoot it down. And so there was an American flag, and one of the old timers told me that he remembered on that morning that on the pasture to the north of the church, there were three men with rifles who came down on horses and were looking to make sure there wasn't a German flag. So it was kind of interesting. The Germans, the Swedes, the Bohemians, or the Czechoslovakians, I guess is what they really were, settled the valley. This is the main street of Cleburne. Today, if you go up to Cleburne, you can still see this little rampway going into here. You can walk this street. You can see some of the foundations. Uh, you had a high school. Here you had the, Randolph, the, the Cleburne Bank. This was the Methodist Church. This was the Lumberyard. This was a little Mission Covenant Church in, in Cleaver. This was that sign that we saw that they carved into the marble. This was the bank again. This is the Chevrolet dealer that they had in Cleaver. And this is just a picture showing you the roadway going into Cleaver and some of the store fronts and stuff that are in Cleaver. So this is the valley down here. Today this is all filled full of Russian trees. This was a little this was a little schoolhouse that eventually the Lutherans made into a church for the people who lived in Cleaver who couldn't make it out to Rio to go to church. Then eventually they closed that down and the a lodge bought it. But when you come into Cleaver today, this retaining wall is still standing there. You can drive right by it. You can go up the street all around there and stuff. This was a little mission covenant church there in Cleaver. At least the building was on the level. The part of the <laughs> the and this is another picture looking out on the valley. Now this is looking up towards the Riedal Valley. This is the road you came up here. Here's the church. Someone was talking about the bridge across the Riedal people actually went together and got a bridge so these people on this side of the river could get over here. And so they have the Red Bridge here. But notice this is Pot County, but it's just barely in Pottawatomie County because the river is a dividing line and that's the church. So here's just an older picture of the church taken back in the 1930s. This was taken about 1960, probably. Or 1959. Yeah. This is just some pictures of the farmland again, of the valley. See what uh, Gladys Phillips did, she went out and gave about over a hundred programs all across the state of Kansas, urging people, telling them about the Tullacrick story, what was happening, getting support, and she would show some of these slides showing what the valley agriculture was. This is this little mm -hmm. stream there. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, now you 
have a choice. Through here, just to show you this is the Randolph Depot years ago. The Randolph had in the 19, I think it was 1915, mm -hmm. they had this uh, motor car wreck where they had a big rain the night before, the river came up, and actually washed out the underpinning of the, of the track. And when the motor car came up early that morning, it, it collapsed and shoved them into the river. Several people died, and uh, it's interesting, Doc Atwood came up to help out, and the first person that he ministered to was his brother, and he had been killed in the, in the wreck. They actually had some people that they found who had floated down the river, and they found them in some brush down there later on. There was a group of teachers who were going to a conference in Marysville, and so several of them were killed. So again, the depot of Randolph. Randolph, west side of the town square. Yeah. Now, this here was the original Citizen State Bank. And then they built the new one over here. Here you have a little hotel from Cleburne. And some more pictures of Ray. Now see, this here was the old Wykander store. Now I don't know how many of you remember Ed Nord, but he was yeah. quite, the, quite the man of the area. He had quite a voice. And at, by the time he had died, he had sang at over 900 funerals. And he was telling me one time, I asked him once, did you graduate from high school? And he said, no, I never did. Because he said, my dad had his jewelry store on top of the Wykander store. And they were having a special promotion on jewelry and, and stuff. And he had ordered in a lot of stuff. And he always had people's watches that he was repairing. And he always kept that a little a little valise that he carried home with him every night. But because he had so much stuff, he decided he'd just leave it at the store. Well, at 2 o'clock in the morning, they came running down and said, Mr. North, the store is on fire. Mm -hmm. And so they ran up there, and they said they had to physically hold him back from running up there to get his stuff. And so Ed North said he had to quit so he could hold jobs to help because his dad had to pay back all the jewelry that was lost and everything. So he worked to pay that back. And this is the corner where the drugstore was built mm -hmm. after that store had been burned down. This is another picture of the town square, people sitting out there. Another better picture of the pool. I, I think at the time I remember, we, had, we didn't have weeds and stuff around <laughs> there. there we, we actually had some cement. But notice the cars out here. They look like 1920s era. Some more pictures of Randolph from the early days. Now this is at the Riley County Museum. This is the Randolph Jail. And so that was uh, rescued before the town went out and it was donated to the museum and they have it out there by the museum. And this is just along the Anticrit River, a lot of springs coming in. Another picture of the Randolph Methodist Church. This is just the Fancy Creek River again. Picture of the gazebo in the snow. The Fancy Creek River again. Now here he's standing up on the roof of a building and you can see the town square, the gazebo. Here's the Randolph State Bank over here. This, I believe, was Ed Nord's car right there. And now you're looking, you're looking out south. If you were going to Manhattan, you would go down here and cross the river bridge here and head out south. Here you have the old again town square. They had an international dealer there, so I guess that's what they... Mm -hmm. so there you can see another picture. There's the old citizen building, there's a new bank building. 
So this probably would have been taken about 1953, something like that. So they didn't have a real good process of removing snow from the street. <laughs> Some of the houses of the town. It was really a unique town. Every street was curved and gutted and sidewalked throughout the whole town. It was one of the first towns, a small town like that, to have a municipal water system. So it really was a progressive little town. Now this is interesting. Santa Claus came to town. Now it's very interesting that in this little picture where you have Santa Claus coming into town, I believe now by in this picture, like it's on the side here, my mom is standing there with us three kids. Oh. And we are in that picture hmm. right there. So this is my mother, <laughs> this is my brother, this is me. This is my sister. <laughs> wow. so we are getting our stuff from two. Santa Claus. Isn't that interesting? Out of all the people that were there that day, and here we are. That's my brother Roger, myself, and my little sister Alma uh -huh. right there. That's my mom. Pretty special. So, tiny history. There's Walt Bell standing out in front of his bank. <laughs> he was quite beloved by the people. bank again. And there he and his wife are at their 50th anniversary. The uh, international dealership burned down about 1955 and a lot of people wondered if they would build back and they did build back. This was the Berkman uh, auto repair oh. building. It caught fire and burned to the ground. And there you have the train by the depot. Now there you have uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the produce shop, and they have uh, poinsettia that is just growing out of the whole place. Mm. Well, this is the grade school. Now notice what they did. The high school didn't have a gym, so they built the gym on the back side of the grade school. So that's where they have the gym. And the high school had the auditorium. And then you had your restrooms, dressing rooms there. I did when I, well, I went to Wallsburg Grade School, country school, for six years, went to Leonardville my seventh and eighth grade year. We did get the play on the old Randolph Gym one before it got to our now. There's the high school building again. Here you see another picture of the town square. We get a lot of Randolph. This is the Beckman IJ store. This is the Pitsy Hardware store next to it. And that was Grandpa's uh, furniture upholstery shop. Right there, that there one on there. the left. Okay. All right. So your grandpa worked in that building, huh? Uh -huh. Okay. I don't think I ever was in that building, but we used to go to the Fitzies and uh, uh -huh. the IJ quite often. And this was the other side of the street. This was the Holmster and Feed store. This was a. Uh, I think that was uh, Jane Russell's, Jane Russell's yes, dance yes. studio. And then the, the Jehovah Witnesses, I think, had their <laughs> their building <laughs> here. And this was the International Theater. This was a little had a dance thing. studio? That was yeah. Blasty's restaurant yeah. to the left. They oh, had a dance right. studio there. Well, I guess they gave dance lessons. This was a cafe bar, uh -huh. I think. Yeah. Now this was the Randolph State Bank, this was the post office in this time period, 1953 Chevy. And this, was a, this was part of the Osborne store at that time, and this was the international dealer that replaced the one that burned down. At one time, this was originally built as a farmer's co-op uh, building, I think. Now you see the town square again. And this is kind of a lot of picture. Now this is over in East Randolph, the elevators. <coughs> and this is inside the Methodist Church, the choir. I think they had a joint uh, Easter cantata. This was inside the Methodist Church.
again a picture of the Pantscrit River. This is taken after the dam has gone in. And this, I believe, was a picture taken on her old farmstead. And this is the old highway going up from Manhattan. If you drive from the dam into Manhattan down on the casement drive or something, you kind of get a feel for what it was like driving through the valley. This was the Garrison Church when it was in Garrison. And this again is a town of Garrison. So you can see where the church was there. You go up this road and then you cross the river about right up there. So you're actually standing here above Garrison, you're looking up towards Randolph. there by the Carnahan Creek Cemetery. Is, is, is that the original place it was? Yeah. Uh -huh. My father-in-law, that was the United Presbyterian Church, and they used to go to the United Presbyterian Church in Manhattan. And he said that back when they were there, that the minister went out there on a Sunday, on a cold Sunday morning. And, you know, he was serving the two churches, and the, they had the old wood still fired up, and he was up there giving a sermon. There was probably about 15, 20 people there. And he looked out on the crowd and everybody was asleep. And he decided, what's the point of coming out here if you're all going to go to sleep? So he said, you can come into town and go to church. <laughs> Rocky Ford. They still have a dinner up there at Yes, every Memorial Day yeah. they will go out and gather. Yeah. There you have the sign. This is taken from the front porch of the Bulls Hotel. Mm -hmm. And then they had, when they premiered the film, Tell a Quick Story, they had a big parade. And so these are some of the floats from the parade. Tell a Crick is silly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. The Bowles Hotel, wasn't that Shalanders before Bowles had it? Or did Shalanders just live? The Bowles Hotel was actually built, was originally a Beckman home. Shalander is down on, across to the south of the, the cafe. They had well, the that's cafe. where the business was. Yeah. Didn't they just but live they, there? Maybe they just lived at the... They might have lived at the hotel, but their there. business was there at the store. Yeah, the I know home. where the business but the bowl, was. All I ever knew was the Bowles had it at the time. Okay. So that they, and this is Winkler with their float. Now these are the people who were heading out to uh, Washington, D.C. to tell people about that stop telecrit. So here they are. Their bus all loaded up, signed on it. And here you have Kansas. And these are the ladies who are heading out. Some of you might recognize some of these people. This is Mrs. Yanis from Old, she was, she was eventually from the bank in Oldsburg. And this is her granddaughter who is now Judy Lippert. Judy. Yeah. Judy who? Lippert. Oh. And this is Alicia Mandel Alicia. here. They're 
This was basically the women at this time. They they were, there were people who flew out on the on planes, mm -hmm. but this was a bus. And they were how long were they there? In Washington D.C., they were probably it probably took about a week by the time they left and came back. I'm kind of surprised that that K State never got involved in terms of talking about the loss of agricultural production with this valley, or did they just kind of stay out of it? Well, the big thing you got to realize is that in this time period, flood, well, floods were really very much a concern of people, and uh, you know, in the Missouri River Valley, there were hundreds of dams being proposed, and I think at that time you were just you were pretty hard pressed to go against the building of dams. In fact, my theory is that in the end result, Tuttle Creek had to be built. The Army Corps could have conceded that, yeah, Blue River didn't really cause the flood or anything else, but we have to build Tuttle Creek because if we give if we give in on Tuttle Creek, we're going to have a fight at every other dam that we ever build. And so it became a do or die situation, and they had to build Tuttle Creek. And certainly we see with Milford. Milford and Wil Wakefield just kind of came back and said, all right, come in and do what you got to do. We'll move out, take us away. They, there wasn't the protest that you had here. But I think if we <coughs> thought of Tuttle Creek, then the Army Corps would have had to fight every, every time. It would have been rough. Now, this is the day that they premiered the movie, and these are the people waiting in line to get in to see the movie. This is when they started building the bridge. That's about what it looks like now. Yeah, it really is. There's no water, not much water up there. Now there's a church being moved. And there you have, in 1953, that's as far as the dam came. Now you see the dam starting to come across. To see what they had to do, they had to get the control tower built. And then you had to get the river diverted through it so you could tie the two, close it off here. And until they did that, the river has to keep flowing through. So you have to get the control tower built to change the course of the river. And you can see here the river is still running through the middle of the valley. So you drive across the dam, you'll see a little sign saying entering Potawatomi County. Well, that's where the river used to be. There's all the construction below. That's probably Tuttle Puddle on its early day. And there's a lake. Snow covered. Now you see here, this probably is 1960 when we had the 60 inches of snow, but this is where Shalander had his funeral home, and this was right. his, his store. But notice that they've got everything torn out except for the stone walls here. So you're probably this is probably in about March of or uh, March of 1960. And Eshbaugh had his furniture store there too. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Eshbaugh had come in and helped out Shalander and the funeral home, etc. Mm -hmm. Then Eshbaugh, when he left Randolph, went to Hope, mm -hmm. Kansas. So here you see the town square again with all the snow. And you see this house getting ready to move out. And then when the snow melted, we had a flood in the old town of Randolph. And there were still people living in the town of Randolph it's at that like time. That. said that the town flooded in ways that it had never flooded before because the water was backing up from the, the dam rather than coming into the river. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Bob and Marilyn Johnson standing out 
after the town, and the old town side of Randolph. I think that's where Bob's house used to be. He lived in Randolph. And then they found this same little remnant of there about Beckman from 1911. Actually, Edna Beckman. Some of you, Edna, back when I first started working with the Historical Society, Edna Beckman was pretty active. Mm -hmm. Came around a lot of things. So she must have carved that in there with, in 1911. And this is just a peach grove. And Marilyn Johnson comes from Peach Grove, so she has a few pictures up there at that side. Peach Grove School. Is that still there? That school is still there. Yes, it is. Where is Peach Grove from Randall? Peach Grove is. Uh, Peach Grove is. It's almost to the Marshall County line. I mean, you're just a yeah. little bit short. If you go up to where you turn off to go to the Sweet Crib Church, if you would turn and go to the west, you would travel what they call the Jerusalem Road. Mm -hmm. And if you get to the top of the Jerusalem Road, you go down through the valley, wind up, you get to the top and you come into Peach Grove. And they call the Jerusalem Road because the Sweet Crib Church was started first, and then they mothered the Fancy Crib Church and then they came back and mothered the Peach Grove Church. So there were three evangelic, German evangelical churches in a row there, and they called that the Jerusalem Road, which tied all three of those churches together. Now the Peach Grove Church is no longer operational, has been torn down, but the Sweet Creek and the Fancy Creek Churches still survive. And this was the Peach Grove Church. I think this was the old Detmer farm. Maryland was a Detmer. This, was one place. this is the schoolhouse of Winkler. It's about to fall in. This was the schoolhouse of Mayday. And this was the schoolhouse of Rose Hill. And this one here, I forget where that one was. This was the Walnut Creek Schoolhouse. And this might have been the old Sherman Schoolhouse. This was, this was the Alert Schoolhouse. This was Pleasant Hill. This was the last one-room school in Riley County. It closed in 1965. This was Laurel Hill. Is that still there? It's still there, but in awful poor shape. Yeah, they track they, they give it to the historical society. Yeah, they tried. They center. tried to give it to the historical society, but it was too far away. Now this is the Center Hill School. Still operates in very good shape. They still say the only voting place in the county that does not have indoor plumbing. <laughs> And so that's still operational. You go up there, the school desks are still there, the teacher's desk, the piano, the slate, blackboards, they're all there. It's just an old school. That's just about a mile or so west of the, of the Sweet Creek Church. Okay, how are you holding up? We still can show you the building of the dam if you want to look at that. 52, we got the authorization to go, they have to go in and start core drilling. And this is the core drillers coming out there just to see what the, the soil is like. So we're actually getting started. 1952. Now they start having to start building the control tower. This is going to be the channel that's going to run the water through the control tower. So you're getting going. And they're getting all the big equipment out there. And of course, the highway went right by there, so I can remember we would stop when we went to Manhattan, pull off to the side of the road, walk over and see what was going on. And you just stand there and watch the big machines work and see what's going on. And you just would stop there, along there and watch it. And then of course they built these signs all over the place. One and a half miles to the side of Big Dam Foolishness, Tucker Dam. And 
And when they were fighting the dam, the Phillips family actually went out and cut this in there with, they, they measured it out with uh, irrigation pipes. And there were some senators coming out to look the situation over, so they cut this in their alfalfa field. The senators stopped the Creek Dam. It was picked up and printed in newspapers all across America. And this is a sign for the premiere of the Tulkrit story. I think the Blue Valley people paid $10,000 to get this movie made. Oh my gosh. And it was a movie producer from Hollywood. That was the big adventure. He was from Hollywood, so he knew what he was doing. And of course, here you have the river again. And in 1953, the dam just came right up to the river and stopped. And that was the core part of the dam that they had going at that point. And there you can see again, just the valley of that dam over there. And again, you start to see how they're taking the rock out of the hillside here and moving it across the valley. So now the control tower is starting to come out. <coughs> now you're building. Now we're after the, they're starting up again after 1955 and things are going. Now we move back a little bit. This is taking a look at the control tower, all the depth they had to dig through, the different levels of rock down to make the base for the control tower. And they worked night and day, so you can see they had great big lights out here to light their operation. There's the tubes going in there and stuff. The dam got me into a lot of trouble as a kid. We had a big, my relatives were down from Nebraska and we were uh, discussing Tuttle Creek at the dinner table. And we had gone down, they, to a thing at Tuttle Creek, they got a little informational book about it. So a little low in the conversation, I thought, you know, that book would really help explain a lot of stuff. So I just turned to my dad and said, Dad, where's the damn book? <laughs> and my aunt just stopped in mid-sentence and said, well, how are you raising your kids? You know, use that language at the dinner table. And so I thought it was innocent. I thought, that would be good. Anyway, there you see the, the tubes going across here. Yep. Interesting. The process. Now you're looking below the dam at some of the construction buildings. Now we're up at the observation point looking down towards Manhattan and notice a two-lane highway going out here. We're still they finally put this observation point in so the people would have to step down on the highway and look at it and kind of see what's going on. There you can see the bridge, the construction bridge that they actually hauled that church across on and got their heavy equipment back and forth on. So now you can see the dam starting across the valley. Now we're a little bit further along. The river is still going across here. We still haven't got it completed yet. The control tower is coming up. Still got the river going through, but the control tower is getting closer. Now we're up here, we can see that now we got a four-lane highway. Now they have got the water coming through the control tower now. We've got a four-lane highway. Things are looking better. The water is going through the control tower. Great. People up there looking at the water, kind of backing up and coming through the control tower. See, they had a great big uh, celebration on the 4th of July when they blew to make the river go through the control tower. Governor Docking, who was the governor at that time, plunged it down and they had a mini, like an atomic bomb. It had the, uh, the uh, shape like an atomic bomb blew up and it blew the soil up and it got the water, water to go in through the control tower. So then you could build your little dam here to stop the river and you could now start building a I've, I've talked to three people that water skied through the tubes uh -huh. at some point, and that picture concerns me. There must have been some time frame where that grid wasn't there. That they were able to do that. The water was coming through, but so I, I still can't figure out the time frame on that. So that before they put that grid in, maybe. I yeah, they actually water skied through the tubes. So yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure they thought it was the smartest thing they'd ever done. Well, they lived to tell about it. Now, in 1960, we had that great snow. 
We had 60 inches of snow in the month of March. And this is Leonardville in the snow. So when that snow melted in one day, we had a lake. This lady in, Leonard, in Riley told me she told people she never lived long enough to see Telecrit full of water, and in one day it filled with water. Quite interesting, as you can see. And so everybody had to come out and see this lake. And I think this is a classic picture. Oh, yeah. Of the cars lined up here to get up. Look at that car, it's even boiled over waiting to get up here to see the water. Everybody had to come up and see this. Quite a classic array of cars. And once they got up there, this is what they saw. Look at all that driftwood piled up in front of the dam. Was there any equipment that got stranded because of that one day, Phil? Did you ever hear that? Probably. Okay. Now this is a picture Ed Nord took of the entrance to Randolph in the in, in when that snow melted. Is that going up that highway or that other? This highway? is actually coming in as you're coming up from Manhattan. You okay. cross the Pansy Creek Bridge here and go into the town. The town square is right okay. up here. Because I know that there's a road that came over on the east, like the east side of the state park, and then the one that just been on the west. So okay. I'm just trying to this one here, if you go up there now. As you cross over the bridge and you come down there on the south side, looking over to the town square, mm -hmm. this this would that That's road would be kind of in front of there. Mm -hmm. This would be the bridge that crossed you. Now the dam is getting more complete. Mm -hmm. And actually, I remember after about 1961, 62, it was kind of dry, and you could drive up and down the valley, and you thought, oh yeah, this was really going to be a lake, huh? You could just drive all over the place. <laughs> now the water's starting to come in. Now you got the paving on top. The water still isn't too much in the lake yet. you start to see it filling in. They built a new observation point. And you see the, the bridge with water up there back at the very beginning. Now so you used to have over here, this is the old town square here, uh -huh. but you had you could boat all around it. You had the little marina back here. And of course, 93, you have the overflow. And you have Manhattan High and Dry, which is what they were fighting to maintain and keep. And the river, you know, back in the 1950s, when the fight was going on against Tucker Dam, Farm Journal Magazine came out and did an article on the Battle of the Blue. Big blue. And they talked to people and talked about what was going on. This was back in the midst of the fight. And then about 1979, 1980, they did a reprise article where they came back and said, who really won the Battle of the Big Blue? And they went back and talked to people who had, they interviewed the first time around, how they had adjusted and what they had done and stuff like that. And at the very end of the article, they said, you know, the real winner of the Big Blue is going to be the river. Eventually the valley will silt up, but the river will still continue to meander and do its thing throughout the valley. It will keep going and it will it will keep going. So he said really the winner of the battle is going to be the river. And so the river carries on. They say that if you go out into the lake, the the water goes out of the control tower, but the flow of the of the water through the valley is still in the river channel. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, when uh, we, my husband and I took a boat and we put in and we followed the river channel all the way to uh, Waterville. Oh, really? Yeah. And once you get out there, you can. You can tell exactly where the river channel is. Huh. And, and we went up the river channel all that way. All the way. Mm -hmm. That would have been interesting. Well, yeah. east of Randall, or Pensacreek, Northeast Pensacreek, there used to be always that row of trees. Yeah. And that was the river. 
yeah. going up north, starting to go north where it's weaker. Yeah. So it's maintained basically its original channel. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. And it's yeah. A matter of Except time. over by the where you see the big bridge now, the river used to go back and go clear across the east end of the, the valley. It looks to me like it's kind of cut a it's channel that goes on the west mm -hmm. side now. But at one time it came out of Randolph and then cut back over to the east side and went down around there that way and came back. But it looks to me like now this kind of cut a new channel there. But otherwise it's pretty much the old they say if it really freezes over and you walk out on the ice, then you can see the river channel pretty good there. Now, people who live by the river, by the lake tell me that it's really something when it freezes and it starts to thaw, that it will start to crack and it will have, it will sound like uh, a rifle shot just as loud as can be as that ice starts to crack. And it's, and it's quite interesting. Anyway, I think that's the end of the slides for you that we have here. That's, uh, you've been most cooperative and patient, I must say. We can turn the lights on. In its location now, how far away is that from its original? Uh, I, I moved here from Pennsylvania. So okay, I, I suppose that you're looking at probably about a mile and a half. Oh, so it's not a, not a huge distance. No, not a, and what they did, what Randolph did is they annexed a little tract of land about uh, so wide, all the way from the old town site up to the new town site, so oh. that it really isn't a new town site, it's just an, an addition to the original town site and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, So even today, if you go up to the, old, the new town site of Randolph, there's a road that goes across the big bridge. If you continue down that road, you will drive down and you'll see the the, where the old town, you can, oh, if you look okay. out, you'll see the old town site in there, yeah. actually. We used to be able to go out there at, on a boat, and mm -hmm. the sidewalks and everything yeah. were there, and you could walk around. And I, is it still there now? It's it been a long time, for the 93 flood. Yeah. I, I know that, if, I've always thought it'd be nice to go back and walk down to where the old church I went to, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that's so silted in now you would never find it. And stuff. It was just a block east of the town square. But I don't think you would ever see it. Well, it was in the water for a long time, too. So yeah. In there. So it's a, Wouldn't there be wells and stuff around well, there? Well, that's what they always said that's you had to be careful of, when, even after the initially it said, you go out to the old town site, but make sure you don't try walking across yards and stuff, because there's dug yeah. wells and stuff that are out there. You could just fall into those real quickly, real easily and stuff, yeah. In the 70s, we were, well, we camped up there all the time, so yeah. in the late 60s, early 70s, we were always going out to the... Town site. Yeah, town site. The you, you, could around. you could probably tell with the old bank and the, with the little squares mm -hmm. tile they had on the flooring, they had black and white tile on the floor in the Doug store in the bank, I remember that, mm -hmm. and stuff quite well, actually. Yeah? I had a question on, when the people lost their river bottom land, was anyone able to keep, say, their upland pasture land, or did they just surrender everything? No, basically they just they bought what they it. needed for the flood, so families still kept their upland pasture and stuff like that. I think your family still has some of their pasture land, right? Yeah. yeah. So they still, yeah, they just bought what they needed for the flood control, yeah. So did people continue to run livestock, or did it, was oh, it just oh, too yeah. hard to yeah. do? Or? Because you still run livestock on yours, right? Well, we, what we've got left up there now is only metal. Yeah. But we run livestock, and then we sold it because it was a pain. Yeah. Uh, to get up there. comes up and down, yeah. and the, the kill the trees out, and then the trees would fall over on the fences. Yeah. You couldn't mm -hmm. keep fences up. They yeah. didn't want you to water out of total. You were supposed to be fenced away from it. However, my grandpa, I think, was the only one in uh, Blue Valley that got water rights to. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't just leave it open and let them go. We yeah. had to build a fence down and build runway to cuddle for them to drink. Huh. But it, it was just pain. And then you had people walking in on your land and yeah. whatnot, too, you know. And you know it, just sold it. But the man that bought it still has cattle. Yes. Okay. Did he get the water right to continue it then? Okay. You know, it's a, you hear all types of stories. I remember good friends of ours who had a home, and they came up and they were talking to people, and, they, and she said, I'd like to keep that corner cupboard that my grandfather built. 
And he said, well, is it freestanding or is it connected, nailed to the wall? And she said, well, it's nailed to the wall. I said, well, then that's ours. You can't take it. So they moved out that morning and came back for something late that afternoon and walked in the house and the cupboard was gone. Oh, wow. You didn't take everything you wanted when you left. It was gone. And so, you know, the story I've always heard is, you know, the, the Germans and Rosalie Thompson developed that land west of the dam. Mm -hmm. And when they built their first house, now this, I, this is a story I've been told, I, I imagine it's true, that they didn't have much dirt for their yard. So her husband went down and loaded up land, soil out of the German farm up on their yard. And a couple of days later, the Army Corps a guy came up and knocked on the door and said, you have something that belongs to us. And he said, what is that? They said, that's soil out in your yard. And they had to load it up and take it back and dump it down in the, oh, in the lake. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, dump it back there to be covered up by water. But he said, that's our soil. So you see why a lot of, uh, you know, it really, a lot of irritation over everything. Because, yes. My mom said that we were late in moving out because my brother came home with chicken pox and then my mom got it, so our move date was moved back and people thought we had already moved out of the house according to whatever schedule had been put out. So they started coming trying to dig up flowers and plants in our yard before we had moved because they thought it was vacant yeah. and people could just come in and take it. Yeah, it's, uh, it, mm -hmm. If you look through the letter that Leona writes about the, the closing of the Riedel Church and stuff. She said we really didn't want anybody to know about it because one night they were working at the church and as they left there was a car parked down along the road waiting and they thought they were going to wanting to come up and do what, take whatever they could out of the out of the house. And of course at that time, you know, people would spend their weekends just going up the valley stripping the houses and I know we had my grandparents had a house that was not anywhere close to the valley, but a couple miles out of the valley. And we stored a lot of stuff there. We went down there and it had been thoroughly picked through. Somebody had just gone through and rifled the house. Because, you know, at that point, if we had an abandoned house, it was free for the takings, they thought. So they just sort of threw all that. Yeah. I think I remember my grandfather saying, and they were up near the Winkler area, so they weren't, they were close to Fancy Creek, but uh, the house wasn't taken in the dam. But they had the native walnut woodwork in their house from the actual original walnut trees along the yep. creek. And people went up and stripped that and stole that. That was a real common thing to get stolen was the woodwork. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I you know you hear all types of stories now. Some of one of the stories they tried to put out I have no idea, but it, it it makes for good conversation anyway. You know, always time people say, well, you need to write a book, and I always think about Hooker Bowles, and he lived in Randolph, and Hooker had gone off to World War II, and he was a cook, but he came back and he was out in East Randolph at the Bellman gas station telling everybody how he fought the Germans single-handedly, held them off, and it was such a battle. And Harold, Harold Bellman was back fixing tires, and he came out and said, Hooker, I can't take it anymore. That's a bold-faced lie. You were a cook. You didn't do any combat. And Hooker said, yeah, I know, but it sure makes a damn good story. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, a lot of this makes good stories. So I don't know. But there are people who claim that some of these Army Corps people had a behind-the-scenes handle with antique dealers, and they would tell them when these houses are going to be vacated, they'd come up and strip everything, take it to another state and sell it, and then give a little kickback to them for what they got out of it. So, and of course, back in the 1950s, antiques were kind of on the ascendancy at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now today, they aren't quite that on the ascendancy. You know? Your kids are looking at you and saying, why do you want this old junk around? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew when they moved the cemetery, so they had asked for the family or had somebody there. Yeah. So we lived right beside Melbourne yeah. Cemetery. And as a kid, I was scared to death all the time they was doing that. Yeah. And of course, they brought people in that weren't native people that was doing it. And so. I know how frightened I was, but I never knew. And, see, you know, they, we had they, relatives there, but I, I guess I just wasn't. See, they housed them in the houses in Randolph, the people that moved the cemeteries. There were vacant houses, so the government let them live in those houses. 
but they made it very clear that we were to have nothing to do with these people because they were totally inoculated against every disease that could be had because digging up these bodies, they could have that. And so we were to have nothing to do with them. But the interesting thing is we had relatives buried in the old Randolph Cemetery and they initially said, you know, this would be done very dignified. You could have a minister there when the grave was open. You'd have a body put in a hearse. The casket would be carried to the new cemetery. You could have a reburial and you could have a little service there. Well, mm -hmm. they actually hauled in hay racks and just loaded them up on the hay racks and hauled them out there and stuff. And, uh, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't that uh, big of a deal. But they and moved the headstones and everything? Yeah, you know, they moved the, the headstones. They tried to reconfigure the cemetery like it was in the new location and stuff. How many but cemeteries were moved? Do you have any other? Well, there were quite a few. They gave the number Did of they people in that paper that I had there. That they, they get all of them? Are they sure they got all the cemeteries? Well, as far as they knew, if you go into some of the cemeteries that were moved, you'll see a little cement thing with a little plaque and it says, I'm no one. I'm no one. So you would do that, but I'm sure they didn't get them all. There are probably some private family cemeteries, mm -hmm. some places that nobody knew sure. about and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, my dad always said that my ancestors, who were buried in the Randolph Cemetery, instead of moving them to the new Randolph Cemetery, we moved them to the Leonardville Cemetery. And he said they did more traveling in death than they did in life. <laughs> Back in those days, people didn't travel very far, so they, they did more traveling then. But I might, now I know my great uncle. He was our family rep. And he told them when they were digging the graves, he said, now I have a grandmother who's buried in the cemetery, but there's no tombstone or anything. She was buried in the potter's section of the Randolph Cemetery. And they said, you know where it was? And he said, it's over by that cedar tree. So he said, they went over there and they dug down about six feet. And he said, there was a layer of the richest brownest soil you could see. There was a couple buttons and just a couple of bone fragments. And they just put it all in a box and moved it. So, mm -hmm. you know. Like this. I wondered about that because I'm sure a lot of those weren't put in a coffin or yeah, something. And, and even then, you know, some people said that when those caskets were exposed to the air, they mm -hmm. fell apart mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's quite interesting. Yeah. Now, just a brief divergence. Could you uh, tell us of your experience in teaching and your background? Oh, okay. Well, I, I lived out east of Leonardville. I, I attended Roddy County High School, graduated from Roddy County High School. Went to K-State, got a degree in, I got a Bachelor of Arts degree in History. Found out that the only thing you do with a BA degree in History is teach other people that have BA degrees in History. So I went back and got an education degree. Student taught at Riley County High School. And then I started teaching at Riley County High School and taught at Riley County High School for 41 years, American History, American Government. So, so that's basically our resume, I guess. And I, I, ironically, I never have filled out a resume in my whole life, actually. I student taught, and then the teacher, I quit in December. The teacher I student taught with resigned on the 28th of February. So the 1st of March, I started teaching, and I taught there for 41 years after that. So this came and said, you student taught out here? You finish out the year? I said, yeah, and they just kept hiring me. So I did that. But you also are one of the only ones in the area or in Kansas that taught uh, a class in Kansas history of all these Well, years. yes, we did. We started a class really called Riley County History, and we have taught a class just on the history, we spent the whole semester on the history of Riley County. And now we have a young man who, when I retired, he's taken up the banner and still teaches yeah. it. So, yeah. so we, we keep it going. But it was interesting. We take a whole semester to teach Riley County History. But I always said that, you know, you people, these kids, they look at Tuttle Creek and they see a lake. They look out south of Riley and see a fort reservation. But at one time there was a civilization a there. And there were people that lived there and they had quite a life. And they need to know that stuff. So it's kind of interesting. So, so we take them out on field trips, see the old town of Cleburne, Bala, all those different places. Quite interesting, yeah. Uh, how many towns were covered uh, besides Milford and Wakefield when they did uh, Milford? Milford? Uh, like well, Elida or Lita, whatever it was. I don't think they were. They did take out the town of Broughton, mm -hmm. and but that's never. That's more like a animal preserve, you know, wildlife mm -hmm. preserve area and stuff. But actually, the guy who comes out of Broughton now has really started something at K State to try to preserve the history of these small areas and is building up quite a repertoire of that. Well, my husband's family lived in that town, uh, Lita, Lida, whatever it was. 
and you know I have letters from there yeah. postmarked and stuff and I don't they, I don't think that was taken out I think it's still you know just kind of dwindled away but I I think it's a little bit to the west of uh, the dam and stuff I believe I know Junction City has a little display on it yeah. I guess I thought it was Milford so I need to go back over there yeah bit. look it up and stuff okay anything else mm -hmm. Well, it's great to come down to share. I appreciate your patience. Wow, this is great. That's a fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So do feel free to look at some more of the stuff there. There's other stuff back there. Like I say, that one big holder is full of uh, remnants of some of the stuff from Doris and Leona Boleyn's collection. We either made copies or they have duplicates.